will I would like to present our next speaker, Dr. Pierre, uh, Professor Pierre Kriskowiak. He is a consultant neurologist in MediClinic Airport Road, and he's going to talk to us today about clinical management of APD. Why the wait? And this symposium is sponsored by AbbVie Pharmaceutical. Dr. P Professor Pierre, the virtual floor is yours, sir. Okay, Th thank you so much, Dr. Shatila, for, for inviting me to this meeting, and thank you uh, to, uh, to have this. So I'm going to deal with the system because I'm not really familiar with it. Maybe you're going to confirm me that you see my presentation right now. Yes, I can see it. Thank you so much. So, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, a very special topic, uh, actually, as a second line treatment in Parkinson's disease, because it's, uh, it stays in my memory uh, as uh, I participate in the launch of Duodopa in Europe now 10 years ago. So, I'm really delighted to participate in the launch of Diodopa and soon uh, to a pomofin pump uh, that are, have been or are about to uh, be uh, registered in UAE uh, beside, of course, deep brain stimulation. So, if you allow me, I'm going to talk uh, about Diodopa throughout a case report. And really, uh, according to me, what is really important for a second line treatment and especially for Diodopa is when to propose it. And, and what to what kind of patient. This is really very, very important. So here are my disclosures. So this case report starts with Mr. Brown, 59 years old. Is he an antique dealer in Dubai? Uh, he has a PD for seven years. And initially, when he was 52, he presented with a rest tremor of right hand with bradykinesia and rigidity, mild one. And uh, it was treated by uh, Razagilin for six months, and Razagilin was not enough to control uh, the, the symptoms, and uh, it, rapinirol extended release was put as add-on therapy at 8 milligrams, because above 8 milligrams, the patient presented with disabling excessive daytime sleepiness with an upward scores uh, at uh, 14. So one year after this is onset, um, uh, the in plus, uh, in addition to razagilin and to ropinirol, levodopa was introduced with three intakes, morning, noon, and evening, at 100 milligrams cinemet. Two years after this is onset, four intakes of levodopa since tremor and pain in right upper limb, not OP, upper limb, are bothersome in late afternoon. So finally, four intakes at 8 a.m. noon, 4 p.m., 7 p.m. And now, for one year, he complains of very important disability with an early morning food dystonia. He has motor fluctuation and non-motor fluctuation with pain in right upper limb, sweats, abnormal, abdominal bloating and anxiety in off periods, uh, especially in the late morning and in the late afternoon and in the early morning as well. So, um, Cinemet was switched to uh, COMT inhibitor, especially Stalivo, because the goal of the patient is, of course, the continuation of his professional activity. But currently, so, uh, her, his functional disability gradually worsened, uh, the quality of life is impaired, and the patient is depressed. It's very important for the following. And he is depressed because he is really afraid to have to discontinue his professional activity shortly. So he reports half times around 55% of waking times. So waking time is 16 hours. In his best on state, he presents with almost no disabilities. It's also very, very important because it means he's very DOPA responsive. Um, but you have some bothersome head dyskinesia in parallel to improvement of motor science, very severe one, actual and mostly head and actual actually, and he, he complains to be uh, more tiring, slower than before, with nighttime awakenings, with the need to take a long nap every day due to, again, excessive daytime sleepiness despite just eight milligrams of a pinnerol. So really, it's crucial for him that he remains active, and 
you can see here the video of not this patient but another one uh, with very severe dyskinesia, specifically it's very severe actual dyskinesia, actually general dyskinesia. Just here uh, 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 a picture that shows you that the activities uh, uh, of, of uh, the activities that are most bothersome because of off time and you can see that uh, during off time, I want to stop this one, it's after a second line treatment, be, uh, before, uh, with the off time, uh, dressing is difficult, washing and keeping clean is difficult, communicating is difficult, getting around the house is difficult, walking short distances is difficult, so all this participate in the impairment of quality of life. So now, uh, is clinical, clinical examination is, uh, is performed in off state, uh, and he has a moderate tremor of right upper limb and low, low, lower limb at two out of four, radicinesia rigidity in right upper limb and low, lower limb, and very mild one in left upper limb. He presents with a slow and shuffling gait with moderate freezing of gait. What is again really, really important that the patient tells you that freezing of gait does not fully improve in the best on states. It means sometimes when he cross uh, a door, uh, uh, he has a very, very mild freezing of gait. This is very, very important for the following. So the MDS UPDRS model score is 23 and he has uh, an your stage at two. So actually is at this uh, stage of the disease with in red the response threshold and in, in black the dyskinesia threshold. So the treatment is Salivo 150 and Cinemet 100 at 7 a.m. and Salivo 100 at 10, 1 p.m., 4 and 7. So actually has five intakes of levodopa a day with also Rekip, uh, always eight milligram in the morning because we cannot go above this draw, those uh, due to excessive daytime sleepiness. And Xanago replaced Azelec to try to cope with a dyskinesia. As you know, Xanago has also an anti-glutamatergic effect that can help in dyskinesia. So question one. So what the who for second line treatment? And when I ta I'm talking about the second line treatment is duodopa, deep brain stimulation, and apomorphin pump. So does this patient present with a clinical profile suitable for a second line treatment? So we got a few proposals. Yes, disabling dyskinesia. Yes, troublesome the motor fluctuation. Yes, the patient seems to be very dopa responsive. Yes, troublesome non-motor fluctuations. Yes, quality of life is impaired. And six, all the proposals are too true. And actually, all the proposals are true. This patient has a good clinical profile for second line treatment, whatever the second line treatment. So second line treatments, again, it's apomorphin, perm duodopa, and deep brain simulation. So it's proposed in advanced PD. We will come back on, on the semantic of advanced PD a little bit later. So finally, what are the official recommendations? So we have very clear recommendations from the uh, International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society in 2008 and 18, and you can see that uh, duodopa, but also deep brain simulation, but also apomorphin pump, because now it's not red, it's, it's, it's uh, green actually. Uh, it's not possibly useful, it's clinically useful because in the meantime you had the a Toledo, Toledo study that has been published. And so all these treatments for motor fluctuation but also for dyskinesia, mostly uh, duodopa, uh, duodopa and but also deep brain simulation, all this is clinically useful, definitely, both for motor fluctuation and dyskinesia. So now, so, we, we just have seen that this patient has the very good clinical profiles in terms of clinical symptoms to be eligible to, for a second line treatment. Now, among the second line treatments, um, can we can we determine some specific clinical features that can that can lead us to duodopa among the two or the three uh, second line treatments again, namely um, dopamorphin pump, DBS, and duodopa. So, 
The question is, why does this patient present with a clinical profile more suitable for duodopas than for DBS or apomorphin pump? Mild freezing of gait in unstate is noticed. He presents with excessive daytime sleepiness, is depressed. Moderate freezing of gait in unstate is noticed. All the proposals are true. And actually, mild freezing of gait in unstate is noticed definitely when in the best on state of the patient you have a mild even a mild freezing of gait is definitely not eligible for deep brain stimulation otherwise you're going to be in very very early and very bad trouble early you present with excessive daytime sleepiness um yes of course if you present with excessive daytime sleepiness it's not like freezing of gait for DBS, which is definitely contraindicated when it's present in unstate. But if you have excessive daytime sleepiness with a propineural above 8 milligrams, you are likely to present with rapid excessive daytime sleepiness with apomorphin pump, definitely, which is uh, the most uh, uh, classic and disabling side effects of apomorphin pump. He's depressed. Is depressed? Definitely. You can propose apomorphin pump, you can propose duodopa pump, you cannot propose deep brain stimulation. Definitely. Otherwise, you have a higher risk of uh, worsening of depression after surgery. And uh, when I say worsening of depression, I mean also suicide risk. Definitely. So moderate freezing of gait in on-state is not is moderate freezing of gait in uh, in, in on-state is not really a, a, an issue for for duodopa. Uh, it's an issue for uh, 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 sorry. Uh, it's not uh, moderate freezing of gait in on-state. It's in off-state. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. So in off-state, if you have a patient who is freezing of gait in off-state, if this freezing of gait uh, completely disappears in on-state. You can propose this patient for the three second line treatment. Again, this is only if the patient presents with a freezing of gait in on state that you have to be very careful. So, in summary, what is a good duodopa profile? So, ideally, uh, and I'm talking about the really restrictive indication, you can propose duodopa, and you have, actually, you can propose deep brain stimulation or apomorphin pump if you have a patient very dopa responsive. Which is under who is under optimal medical treatment, uh, the disease has an impact on daily and social professional life. He has disabling tremors. This is for DBS. He has motor complication of dopa therapy. I mean, motor fluctuations and dyskinesia, and he has also non-motor complication of dopaminergic treatments. And probably this is here. Uh, we are completely not sure, but probably in the in the future, some patient could benefit from a second line treatment even though when they don't present with motor complications of dopa therapy, but only non-motor complications. But with your dopa, you can also propose a treatment for a patient who is marked freezing off uh, with a moderate or mild or moderate postural instability, falls are possible, with mild or moderate dementia, with apathy and depression. With... So you can see that actually, the criteria, the indication to put a patient under duodopa are a little bit le less restrictive than the DBS ones. This is really very important. So question three, now the when for a second line treatment. So in this case, case, is it a good time to consider a second line treatment? No, the patient is too young. No, the duration of the disease course is too short. No, it's too early. It's not an advanced PD. No, the oral treatment can still be optimized. No, if you send a patient to an expert center for a second line treatment to be implemented, you will never see your patient back again. If I put this proposal here, it's because it's by experience, actually, in Europe. Because a lot of colleagues were afraid of that. And of course, there is no need to be afraid of that because all the proposals are false. Uh, the patient is too young. No, there is no patient too young to benefit for a second line treatment. No, the duration of the disease course is too short. No, of course, there is, we don't have any limit for the course of the disease. It's too early. It's not advanced PD. We're going to talk about that in the next few slides. No, the oral treatment can still be optimized. Yes, of course, you can always still optimize, optimize the treatment. But once the patient 
after one week, two weeks, or even one month, he, he comes back to see you because the, 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 the uh, adjustment of treatments you have proposed in the previous visit just lasted uh, 10 days or 15 days, definitely you should move to the second line treatment. Now, if you send a patient to an expert center for a second line treatment to be implemented, you will never see a patient back again, of course. It's completely false, and I'm going to try to convince you. So, when to move to a second line treatment, or how to identify patients eligible to one of these treatments? So, as you understood, this is really, really important to refer the patients not too late, to propose this patient to a second line treatment not too late, because the goal is definitely to maintain quality of life, to maintain social interaction, to maintain professional activity. You don't have to wait for the patient to be retired to propose this kind of treatment. So, what does advanced mean? So, here there is a very interesting paper by the team of Pablo uh, Martinez Martin with the CDEPA questionnaires that can help you to detect what does it mean advanced. But actually, advanced it means clinical manifestation and severe clinical manifestation and disability, severe motor and non motor communication partial poor response to conventional pharmacologic therapy. And really, here you have a very old paper, 10 years ago, with an advanced PD group defined by above six years of PD symptoms, that actually you can have an advanced PD patient under six years of PD patients. And you can see that what's really bothersome for patients, again, is much of fluctuation to medication and dyskinesia. So, sorry. So, um, how uh, to easily detect uh, the uh, advanced PD? I, I call it, oh, I'm sorry, because here I don't know what's going on with my slides. Well, maybe, let me check, oops. So, what I wanted to show you, actually, is uh, what is a 5 to one Professor rule? Pierre? Yeah. Five minutes remaining, sir. Okay. What is a 5 to one rule? The 5 to one rule is you should propose a patient to second-line treatments if he has five intakes of levodopa daily, if he presents with at least two hours of off stage daily, and if he presents with one hour daily of troublesome dyskinesia. This is really uh, the issue. So it should be not too early and not too late, because of course, if you propose a patient to a second-line treatment when he's demented, when he's in his wheelchair, when he presents very severe freezing of gait, it's too late. So it means refer the patient for a second-line treatment, even if it's too early, but please, not if it's too late. So uh, Abvi has uh, uh, prepared a very interesting tool to determine uh, when and what kind of patient should be referred for a second-line treatment. This is called Manage PD making informed decision to aid timely management of Parkinson's disease. So how to use it? It's quite easy. I'm not going to talk about it right now because it's still under uh, process. It has not been officially launched. But this is a very interesting tool which aim, whose aim is to determine which patients are and when, which patients are suitable for a second-line treatment, whatever the second-line treatment. And actually, at the end of uh, this uh, tool that is, will be accessible on the internet, you will be able to determine if the patient is the category one, category two, or category three. Category one, you can keep control of the patient with the oral medication. Category two, a patient may not be controlled on the current treatment regimen, uh, but uh, um, additional benefit may be obtained from further treatment optimization. So you can try to adjust oral treatment. Category three, definitely you cannot control this patient with oral medication alone, and it should be referred for uh, a second line treatment. So in conclusion, levodopa, carbidopa intestinal gen, duodopa provides a, a therapeutic option for patients with advanced Parkinson's disease who have off episodes that cannot be satisfactorily controlled with standard medical therapies. Duodopa has proven a long-term safety and tolerability profile. The role of Duodopa as a treatment for patients with PD and motor complications will ultimately be determined by trials that provide a full assessment of its relative safety, efficacy, and cost compared with 
other available therapies such as deep brain stimulation. And my last slide, patient with optimal clinical profile for second line treatment should be referred on time to expert centers with a dedicated and experienced team. The managed PD online system provided by AVV is a very useful tool to help the neurologist decide which patient should be referred and when, and patient's management before and after implementation of Duodopa or any other second line treatment needs a strong cooperation between the implanting center and the treating neurologist at any time. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Pierre, for the excellent lecture and informative information about Duodopa and who would benefit. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Dr. Joseph Alona. Uh, his question is, what percentage of patients with Parkinson's disease in the UAE are expected to benefit from second-line treatment, in your opinion? Of course, you know that in UAE, we, there is really a lack in, in epidemiological studies. So I'm going just to talk about the epidemiological studies available, and especially the, uh, the Western uh, epidemiological studies, especially in North America and Europe. So globe overall, it has been assumed that 8 to 10 percent people could benefit from deep brain stimulations, and probably 14 to 15 percent patients uh, with Parkinson's disease could benefit from duodopa or apomorphin pump. So actually, it's not just uh, an exceptional treatment. It can uh, help 15 uh, percent of patients, actually. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, it looks like we have no further questions. Thank you very much, Professor Pierre. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. much appreciated and always nice to see you. Hopefully we'll Thank meet you. in real life and someday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.